right, everybody. Hey, welcome to church. Go ahead and pull your notes out of your worship guide. We're finishing up our series, Coping, Hoping, and Doping. It's been a fun series, right? Uh, it's been, I, I do believe this, it's been a healthy series for, for many of us. Because um, here's what we know. Uh, by and large, most of us are really, really bad at walking through difficult seasons of life um, in a healthy way. Most people um, cope and, 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 and through circumstances and circum, uh, situations of their life in really, really unhealthy ways. Um, and there's a reason for that because we've, we've talked about this week one that, you know, the Bible says all good things come from above. And God has designed like everything in this world that's good. He created. Um, the, the problem is that there's an enemy of this world, Jesus says, is the God of this world. And the Bible says that, um, that anything, it reminds us, like anything God's ever created, like there's been a counterfeit created for it. Like, for example, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the difference between joy and happiness. Paul talks about joy uh, in the book of Philippians, and he's going. We're going to be in Philippians today. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter one. And uh, in the whole book, the whole the, the theme of Philippians is joy. Like make my joy complete. We're going to read some verses today that have joy mentioned in them, and and like all in this, like he's writing about the joy of the Lord, while history reminds us that he's under house arrest, awaiting a death sentence it, that actually came to pass. The death sentence actually happened, and so. <clears throat> We recognize that he's reminding them of joy. Why? Because his, his, the joy that he received wasn't based on the circumstance that he found himself in. You see, happiness is a counterfeit of joy. Why? Because happiness is something that we're all conditioned to chase after and seek after in our lives. And the reason is because it is so temporary. Like, you can't be happy. Nobody on earth, there's not a human on earth that can be happy continuously forever, all the time. Why? Because it's circumstantial. It's why they say that um, the average millennial or the, even now the average Gen Z, they say by the time they graduate, I mean, by the time they're ready, graduate, by the time they're ready to retire, they will have worked at over 50 different uh, organizations and had 50 different jobs over their lifespan. Why? Because they're conditioned. We are taught and conditioned that if it doesn't make you happy, just do something else. Just find something else. And so we go from job to job and from relationship to relationship. And like, they're not making me happy anymore. They're not always going to make you happy, right? Like, um, uh, uh, thing to thing, stuff to stuff, car to car. Why? Because I'm all happy until I'm not. Everybody was happy with the new job until you realized you had to work with that one person who makes life miserable, and you don't want to look at them when you walk in the office anymore. You were happy about it. You loved the new car until your spouse or kid put a scratch on it. You know what I mean? Or until you, you walked outside of Walmart one day and somebody didn't put their buggy up and it smashed into the side of your car. You were happy until now it's worthless. It's useless, right? Uh, you loved the new iPhone. Until the new one come out. <laughs> and it's the same one as the last one. Like, well, we all know that, but it's not the same, right? They have USB-C now. I'll leave that there. <laughs> Listen, I got iPhone. I'm still, are you kidding me? That's what you're going to give us, right? It's not making me happy. <laughs> like, it's conditional. Here's the truth. Every counterfeit that the enemy has ever created is all temporary. Always. It will always be temporary. And so today, I want to remind you, I want to share with you, um, uh, remind us of like what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27. He said, peace is what I live with you. It's right there in your notes, our theme verse. It's my own peace that I give you. I don't give it to you as the world does. You want to underline that. Don't be worried. Don't be upset. Don't be afraid. What do we remind ourselves of earlier in the month? We said that the world cannot give what the world has never possessed. Like the world can't give you joy. The world can't give you peace. Everything that we would seek and need uh, uh, for a life of joy and contentment in this world, it comes from God alone. And so week one, we talked about that. It's gonna, be, it's gonna require something bigger than a Band-Aid. Like we believe that, we would say that anything the world offers is, is uh, it's no, not much greater than a Band-Aid. Um, you ever tried to put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound? Like it's kind of dumb, right? It just doesn't work. Um, well, we've talked about what that looks like in week one, that like, like getting committed 
to the, to the things of God in your life. Week two, we said it's going like, to, we gave you a first aid kit that the scriptures actually do give us kind of step by step how to walk through difficult seasons in our life. We saw that Paul gave us some good instructions. And then last week, we talked about how I just don't grasp, I can't fully understand how people can walk through this life as followers of Jesus without the help and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in their life. How is that a reality? It's just not. Uh, it's it, like like the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked about last week. It's you know the Holy Spirit's practical. He's not weird. He's a comforter. I give you peace. I'm gonna. And what Jesus said in John 14, I'm gonna go. When I ask the Father, He's gonna send you a comforter. He's gonna lead you into all truth. The power of the Holy Spirit is a need in all of our lives. The title of last week's message was "When Only a Doctor Will Do." And so today, we're going to kind of wrap everything up with some priorities. I titled today's message, Triage. Triage. Now, some of you like probably know what that means. When I was a kid, I had no clue what triage meant. I only saw it in like major circumstances. Like you only saw it in the emergency room or you only saw it in like emergency situations. So I immediately was a kid. I always thought, that means somebody's dying. <laughs> That's what it means. Somebody's in trouble, right? Somebody, and when I was a kid, I got needle phobias, right? Uh, when I was a kid, I thought, that means somebody's getting a shot. <laughs> like if I saw it, somebody's getting stuck, and that was not a good thing. But triage simply, it comes from the French word uh, that means to sort and to select. Its historic roots for medical purposes go back to the day of Napoleon when they would triage large groups of wounded soldiers as necessary. Right Over the centuries, systems have evolved into well-defined priority processes, sometimes requiring specific, like crazy amounts of training and uh, on the setting and the organization to get it right. Now, some of us would go, like, if that's what that means, where is the training (laughs) for a lot of times, right? Anybody else ever had to go to the ER and sit for six and a half hours? right? Uh, And you see that sign that says triage, and you're just like, in your mind, if you're like me, like, by the time I'm out of the ER, I don't even remember why I went to the ER. I just want to go home. It feels like prison sometimes when you get into those ERs. But let me explain something to you, okay? I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to lighten it up a little bit for you. Are you ready? Here's the encouraging part when you're seven, when you're an hour seven in the ER. That just means you're going to (laughs) live, That's what it means. It means you're going to survive. You're not, you're not in, you're not in, nobody's, they're not having to like uh, put you on life support. You're in seven, hour number seven, because you're pretty much in good shape. Now, I know if you're like me, that don't help when you're in hour number seven. Somebody come help me, right? But today we're going to talk about what it looks like for us to set some priorities in our faith. The truth is, here's what I know. I know um, that there are lots of people across both campuses, really around the world, there's lots and lots of people who are walking through and uh, very difficult seasons of life. And some of y'all and some of us would say, hey, man, it ain't a season. It's like multiple seasons. (laughs) I done went through four winters uh, of trouble in my life. You know what I mean? You're talking season of life. Like it's been, it keeps coming around. You know what I'm saying? Uh, And you're like, how do I begin to honor God with my life when it doesn't seem that there's light at the end of the tunnel? How do I begin to, how do I begin to find the joy and walk in the joy of the Lord when there just doesn't ever seem to be any joy? Has anybody ever been there? Well, today I want to walk you through um, uh, some passages of Scripture in the book of Philippians. And I'll just give you some historical context real quick. Paul, again, he's sitting under house arrest. Uh, the Bible says that he wrote this uh, book roughly about two years before he was beheaded for his faith. Okay? Get this. He, he went to prison for his faith under house arrest and never got out. There was no light at the end of his tunnel, if, if, if we're talking those terms. It was not going to get better for him. Yet we see, we see that he writes in this book, literally an entire book dedicated to the joy of the Lord. Some powerful passages of scripture come out of Philippians, right? I can do all things. I can do all things because of what? Christ who gives me 
strength, right? We like powerful passages of Scripture. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus' return. Like we can quote some really powerful passages of Scripture uh, in the book of Philippians, and it has nothing to do with his circumstance because his circumstance was pretty, pretty bleak. It didn't look good. But I can tell you that um, because of his ability to see from a different perspective, not only did it, did it make a difference in his life where he was at through his circumstance, but y'all, it changed the lives of millions of people. We're here today because of somebody, because of Paul doing what he did, committing his faith to Jesus and changing the world, planting churches all over. Uh, like it all begins with a shift in my perspective. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to share with you three things out of, uh, out of Philippians chapter one that I think Paul did in a triage moment. What am I going to do? Like I, I have some decisions to make. This is kind of crazy. Like, let's take a survey. Who is good in the room real quick? Who is good at, um, making decisions on your feet? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Quick, quick, quick decisions. I can just, you know, make a decision. Who's going to take 75 days to make a decision? Y'all all frustrate people like me. Because <laughs> I'll, y'all, I'll make a decision and worry about it later. I will jump out of a plane and worry about the parachute. You know what I mean? Somebody, you know why? Because it's y'all people who take 75 days to make a decision. When I jump, y'all are jumping with the parachute to come get me. You know what I mean? Like I have discovered... If I'll just make a decision, they'll figure it out along the way. Uh, and so Paul was a guy, like, like, he, like he could triage quickly. Some of y'all, some of us, like we're, we've been triaging for 12 years. Some of y'all have been like, well, I think I could do this, and I think I could do that, but man, this looks really good here, and what about this over here? And the truth is you could spend your whole life trying to sort and plan and work around and try to find things. And when you could, honestly, you could go to God's word and go, okay, what did they do? Let's work out that way, okay? So Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. I pray in the name of Jesus that you speak to us today. This isn't just another Sunday. Help us not to walk out of this place just marking something off a checklist. But Holy Spirit, I pray that you speak into every individual heart right where they are in their season of life. And God, we walk out of here challenged and equipped to live our life on purpose in a way that honors you for every good work you're calling us to. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Whenever things get hard, the first priority I need to set is this. I need to think of others. I need to think of others. I love it. In Philippians 1, 3 through 6, that's what he did. Remind, remind, remember, under house arrest, waiting a death sentence that eventually came all the things that could have been on his mind. He said, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you've been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ in the time, from the time that you first heard it until now. And I love this. He's so encouraging. And I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue the work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Like he's thinking of others, encouraging others outside of his circumstance, outside of his self. Y'all know the, uh, when, you, when you read the book of Philippians, you'll notice like there was very, it was a very snippet that he actually even mentioned his own circumstance. A prisoner, of Christ, a prisoner because of my, I mean, chains because of my faith. Like that was pretty much it, right? No different than, hey, I'm writing to you from Philadelphia. I mean, like he just kind of just said, here I am. Like I'm like I'm in I'm in prison. I'm writing this letter. Let's get now let's talk about you. I think about you all the time. I just want to encourage you. Like he was in prison for his faith. He had been wrong. He had been cheated. It wasn't fair. And he was thinking about others. Here's a good question I want you to ponder on uh, while we talk today is in what ways are you adding value to people around you? In what ways are you thinking of others in your life? That's a good question to write down and ask. Like, how am I encouraging people around me? I've learned this in my faith that if if I allow my struggles to point me inward, I'll begin believing that life is all about me. If I allow my difficulties to point me to myself, I'll believe 
that it's not about everybody else. It's about me when, in fact, life's about eternity. The gospel calls us to look through our eye, look through the lens of eternity, like to look and, the, and, and to, to value the people around me. Look at this passage of scripture in Philippians chapter two. He talks about, it's not in your notes. You can write this reference down. Chapter two, verses three and four. He says, hey, y'all don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for the interest of yourselves, but take an interest in others too. Paul's reminding them in that moment that the single best way to resist the temptation to cope in unhealthy ways is to begin to see people through the lens of eternity. The the single best way to begin to see hope in my story is to put hope in somebody else's story. So what are some ways? What are some ways that you can think of others? I'll give you a couple, right? Send an encouraging text message. That's easy. That's an easy step. These are very practical steps that you can do. Pick up the phone and actually call somebody. Some of y'all about to walk out, right? Huh? (laughs) Somebody just said, in their mind, somebody said, absolutely not. Pick up the phone. Write a letter in the mail. Somebody said, what is that? (laughs) What's a stamp? Write a letter. A random act of kindness. Buy somebody's coffee this week. Buy somebody's lunch this week. Can I give you a a very practical tip that I have learned to live by? And um, it don't happen, but if you think something good, say it. At any moment, at any time, any way. If you think something good, please don't rob someone of a blessing of encouragement in their life. Because I promise you, if you think something good, I guarantee you, as a follower of Jesus, that thing that you think good is actually a need that they have. They really need to hear it in that moment. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. You think that's just you? No, that's the Holy Spirit in your life. You think something good, say it. Why would we? We we are so conditioned. Like, we keep the good stuff in, and we throw up all the bad all the time. Like, like we will let somebody know what we think about them in a moment. Y'all ever notice, y'all ever notice, like, you know, I hate, I hate Yelp and Google reviews and all that stuff. You know why? Because the only people that ever say anything are the people that are ticked about something. You go look. You try me. Go look at the average reviews on Google. There are far more negative reviews than there are positive reviews. You know why? Because it's just an expectation. When somebody does something good, you you don't even think to say thanks, man. Thanks for breaking the status quo. Thanks for doing what you do. Nobody thinks that because you just expect it to be that way. But boy, when they let you down. Huh? Man, the negative reviews just flow over and over and over. If you think something good, y'all, encourage somebody this week. It'll make a difference in your life and in theirs. I love this quote by Mother Teresa. Love is a one-way street. It always moves away from self in the direction of others. Always. It'll always move away from self in the direction of others. I promise you, when you're walking through a difficult season, one of the greatest ways to begin to experience hope in your life is to produce some hope in somebody else's life. I love it, man. I just When you read, and, and he that began the good work in you is going to finish it, he's going to complete it. When I read that, I'm just thinking, man, what an encourage. He's just encouraging people. You can do it. Don't give up. Don't stop. And he is walking through hell on earth. And he's encouraging those around him. Look and think for others. Number two, write this one down. This one's huge. Paul did it. This is his print. This is his triage. This is his priorities. You need to serve with others. You need to serve with others. He says, he goes on, verse seven. So it's right that I should feel this way about you. You have a special place in my heart. Why? Because you share with me this special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and defending and confirming the truth of the good news. What does he say? We've done this together. We've shared the gospel together. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. You can go back right at the top of your notes in verse 5 of chapter 1. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time that you first 
heard it even up until now. We've been in this thing together. Nobody's doing it alone. We've served Jesus together. Here at Cultivate, you, if you've been here any length of time, you'll know that we place a high priority on serving others. We place a high priority on serving people around us, serving on a team. Why? Because it is the core of our discipleship model. Like our discipleship model is not to to teach you a gazillion verses between now and the time you die and you go to heaven knowing all the verses in the Bible. That's not our discipleship model. Our discipleship model was Paul's discipleship model. Follow me as I follow Christ. Check out what you've seen done in me and duplicate that. Like, there, like there's no better way to grow in your faith than to find somebody who's a little further ahead of you in their faith and just watch how they live their life. Man, how do they, how do they get through that difficult circumstance? Man, how did they walk through that problem in their marriage? How did they overcome? Man, they're married 50 years. How in the world did they make it 50 years? Like learn from others. And we think there's no better way to do that than to like an on-ramp of figuring that out is to serve with other people, this relational discipleship model. Like a life not lived for others, y'all, that's not a life. It's just not. Uh, you'll You'll never convince me if you show, you show me people that are living their life spent, like Paul said, a drink offering for the Father and for the Lord and for the gospel, living their life for the cause of others versus somebody who's living a selfish life, there is zero comparison in the joy that people experience in those two different scenarios. Like, you can't live a selfish life and find that there's hope in your tomorrow. Like, he calls us to serve others. That's why we encourage people so much to serve around here. You can do that easily. Cultivatechurch.tv slash roots. You can go online this afternoon when you get home and shed all the clothes in your underwear. You can learn everything there is to know about the church, everything there is to know about serving. You can even join a team right there and be serving next week on a Sunday. It is the, There is not an easier place on earth than to begin to serve the kingdom than here at Cultivate Church. There's no easier way because we place a high value on it. And let me tell you why. It is not because we're, any of us are needed. Y'all, God don't need me. Y'all know that. You go, well, what's going to happen if you're not here next week? Somebody else is going to be doing it. Like, I, God don't need me. As a matter of fact, there's about 6,000 million, there's a, a million other people that are better at it than me anyways. God doesn't need me. I need him. He doesn't need us. Like, you know, the Bible, one of my favorite passages of scripture is, uh, is in the book of Esther. He talks about Esther and he says, what, what if you were here for such a time as this? And she goes, yeah, but I don't know. He goes, well, if you don't do it, God's going to bring somebody else. It's not about It's not about you. It's not about him needing you. It's an opportunity, right? God's given us an opportunity to partner in kingdom growth. And it grows our faith. It opens our perspective. When we serve those around us, all of the sudden, the things that I'm walking through seem a little bit lighter. They just do. I read a story from Simon Sinek this week. He's an incredible author, by the way. If you've never read any of his books, I would encourage you to read uh, some of his books. Incredible leadership guy. And uh, he was doing an interview, and he he mentioned in this interview how Navy SEALs, the vast majority of Navy SEALs, never make it past training. And they began to do some research on what that looks like. They said that, that, uh, that... he mentioned that only 10% of Navy SEALs actually make it through the initial training phase. And he goes on to say that they began to do research on how that is happening and who is it that actually makes it through and what is different in them than anybody else. Because 10% is an alarmingly low rate, right? For the for, for the pinnacle of the military uh, in the United States. And he says, he said, it's not the big muscle-bound guys. They look impressive, but they couldn't make it. They didn't have what it took. He said, it's not the tattooed, tough guys. They looked scary, but they didn't have what it took. He said, it's not even the college-educated stars. They looked like leaders, but at the end of the day, they didn't have what it took to complete and finish the training. He said, the ones that made it through, ironically, 
don't even necessarily look impressive. There may be times during the training that they're, they're shivering in fear. He said, but at some point during the grueling, punishing training, when they're exhausted, when they're mentally spent, and when it doesn't look like they could take another step, in some way they mustered up enough in them to look to the left or the right and begin to help each other. And they began to learn that the people that make it through are the people that realize I can't make it through alone. And that I'll never finish, I'll never accomplish this task. And in a world that's, that, that teaches us that you, you need to get ahead no matter who you step on. You need to get ahead no matter how bad you beat them. You don't realize that you'll never actually get ahead by yourself. Paul recognized it. He said, we'll never accomplish this on my own. Not that, I'm, not that I'm even there, he goes on to say. But one thing I do is forget the past and press on toward the prize, the high call, heavenward that Christ is calling us to. And he did it with people. He brought people with him. He served with others. Can I tell you today, maybe you're walking through something and you are so tempted to pull away from community. You're so tempted to pull away from relationship. You're so tempted to just, just get off all by yourself into an isolated circumstance. I promise you that is a deception of the enemy and you will be sorry because you weren't designed to do life alone. The Bible reminds us in Galatians for us to carry one another's burdens, for us to do this together. Those of us, and the Bible says in James, those who are sick, those who have a need, bring, call the elders of the church and pray, lay hands and pray for one another. And it says to confess our sins and pray for one another so we can be healed. Salvation comes through Jesus. We recognize that, but he designed it in such a way that healing comes through community. You'll never grow to the full potential Jesus trying to live your faith by yourself. You'll never do it. You'll never do it. So I need to serve with others. Here's the question. What am I doing? What am I doing with my life? What am I doing? Am I, am I serving the kingdom in some way, form, or fashion? And if I'm not, what steps do I need to take to begin to work that out? And then number three, I'll share with you. You need to pray for others. Paul did it. This was his triage. I love this. Let me, this is such a powerful passage of scripture we're about to read. I want you to, re- listen, to listen to me. He's about to pray for people on the other side of a letter. He could, have, he could have prayed for anything. There was no light at the end of his tunnel. He was gonna sacrifice his life for his faith. And listen to what he prays. I pray that your love will overflow more and more. I pray that you will keep on growing in the knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters. So that you may live pure and blameless lives until the, current, until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Now put yourself in his shoes for just a moment. I'm there. Like, let's put ourselves in Paul's shoes. We're under house arrest. We're waiting a death sentence. History tells us he did die. He didn't mention himself at all. I'd have been like, hey, y'all, this ain't, y'all know how crazy this guy is, right? Nero, like, y'all know he's crazy. Like, he's killing people. Like, it's bad. I'm, I'm wrongfully in prison. I did nothing wrong. All I've done is love Jesus and serve people. Like, we've wrecked it. That's on record. I need you to have, y'all need to have prayer meetings, and y'all need to pray for me. Pray for me. Pray that I stay safe. Pray that I get out. Pray that I make it home safely. Nothing else. Don't even make a, new, a bigger list. Number one on the list, me. Number two, me. <laughs> Keep me safe. <laughs> Right? Y'all need to pray that God moves. He didn't do any of that. In the darkest hour of his life, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you'll know what matters most. Here's my question. Is your prayer life pointing out or is it pointing in? Is it about others at all or is it all about you? Paul could have been praying a million things for himself, but he triaged it. His priority was that people would know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Culture teaches us to cope and find hope by looking inward. 
It's what culture teaches us. The gospel reminds us to look out. So here's my question. Who are you praying for? Are you even praying? I'm going to give you some practical steps, and then we're, then we're going to wrap up. Write these down. Number one, not on your list. How do I practically pray more efficiently? Number one, make a list. Ain't no shame in that game. Make a list. Write it down. If I don't have a list, this is me. If I don't have a list, my prayer life gets real redundant. And you know what else I've discovered about Brandon, about me? It's probably true about you. If I don't have a list that keeps me intentional, I gravitate back to me often. Often. If I don't have a list that keeps me intentional, praying for others and praying for things outside of myself, it is really easy for me to circle right back around. Oh, by the way, let's get back to me. Make a list. Number two, this one's powerful. Pray the scriptures. Pray the scriptures. You don't have to make it up. Now, I would encourage you this week, go to Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Put somebody else's name right there. Hey, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, that you'll keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, that you'll know how good God is. There's, a, there's an immense amount of prayer and powerful prayer in Scripture that you don't even have to reinvent the wheel. Like, it's good. Pray, pray the Bible over people. Uh, this one's big. Number three, start and end with praise. Y'all, that just sets the atmosphere. If you will start praying, when you start praying, if you'll just don't dive right in. If you'll just start in that moment. That's what Jesus taught us to do, right? When you pray, pray like this. Our Father, our in heaven, hallowed be your name. Like, like worship, it sets the atmosphere. It just makes it easier to pray. And number four, this one's big. This is the list, right? Pray for the needs of others. Here's a good question. Do you even know the needs of others in your life? Like, do you even know some of the needs of people in your sphere of influence? Number five, this one's huge. Keep record. Keep record. Document your prayers. Like, remind, thank God for answered prayers. Anybody ever done something nice for somebody and they, like, they didn't even acknowledge it? Like you did something really good and you're like, they didn't even say thank you. Like not that you were doing it for a thank you. Like you know what I mean? But like it's frustrating, right? Y'all, we do that to God like on the regular. On the regular. The only time, <laughs> the only time God hears from us is when we got a negative review, right? Like we got a negative Google review. Like, hey God, that's not what I asked for. What the heck? Right? Like, when it's done, like, go back. Keep record. Why? One, one, it honors God, but two, it helps you move on forward. When you can keep record that he did something in your yesterday, it's a good indication he's going to work something out in our tomorrow. Keep record. And then the last thing I'll share with you is just be consistent. You go, yeah, but I'm, I stink at prayer. Yeah, we all, you, you stink at everything until you get do it enough. Right? Who in this room started out doing anything in their life the very first time they ever did it? You were good at it. Nobody. Like, 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 I, like you're not great at something. You're not great at something until you do it consistently. Learn and do it. I'm going to pray for you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Maybe you're here today, and this is my question for you. And I love to end messages this way inviting you just to ask God, God, what do I need to do with this? Maybe you're tuned in online, wherever you're from. What do I need to do with this word? Maybe you're walking through a difficult season of life right now. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your life. Maybe it's your job, your career. Whatever it is, I'm going to invite you to triage some things. Have you, have you focused? Have you, have you bought into the live culture? And far too many times you're just focused on you. Maybe you're here today and you're not a, you're not, you don't believe in Jesus. Maybe he's not your savior right now. And you're kicking the tires on your faith. I, would I want to just share this with you. God's not angry at that. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It said that we've all fallen short of the glory of God and we all need a savior that the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternity in Christ Jesus. 
today you need a savior and you would simply say these words, Father, forgive me of my sin. I'm so sorry I've done it in my own strength and my own ability. If I'm honest, doing it this way is getting me nowhere. So Jesus, today I accept you as my savior. From this day forward, I'm gonna follow you as Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation. Father, I pray for my friends in the room. God, those of us who have long trusted in you, but man, our priorities have just been out of whack. Help us, oh God, to look at life through the lens of eternity. We're not, we're not making light of any struggle in any situation. Now, there are people in this room who are walking through devastating hurt, devastating pain. There are people in this room who have been hurting for years. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would be reminded that our joy in you and our hope for tomorrow is not in this present circumstance. So come hell or high water, my joy comes from Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now that you begin to just insert peace in the hearts and minds right now. God, that we would be reminded yet again that it is not circumstantial. But in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, God, you're going to guide us, you're going to direct us, and you're going to get all the glory. And we are confident in this, that he that began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus' return. That's a true statement. And so, Father, I pray we walk out of here, God, knowing the reality and the weight of that statement. You are so good, and we give you all honor and praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Can you honor Jesus today?